till we meet, till we meet, till we meet at Jesus' feet, till we meet, God be with you until we meet again. Well, amen, brethren. God be with you until we meet again. That was in my heart as I closed the last presentation to you on the introduction to the subject of the Sermon on the Mount. In the last uh, lesson, we discussed and considered the background and introduction basically into the Sermon on the Mount. And even though I want to press forward from that last point that we left off, we've got to consider again the whole of the introduction uh, because of the very important details that we covered and I think it's a great thing and it's a vital thing that we do this now I'm not talking about technicalities but in consideration and in planning uh, for this message this study um, as far as the Sermon on the Mount goes, as recorded in Matthew, um, it's identical to that in Luke. And so I know that many of you are familiar with the arguments about that and some of those technicalities that come up, but I don't hesitate to say that I'm not going to decry the value of a careful discussion, a careful study. But I do feel like there's a need to warn myself, listen carefully, to warn myself and everybody else against becoming so immersed in the mechanics of Scripture that we somehow miss the message. Why do I say that? I say that because we, on one hand, while we should be concerned, we should be concerned about the harmony of the Gospels. Um, we shouldn't be concerned or certainly shouldn't regard the Gospels as some kind of intellectual puzzle. Because, <coughs> excuse me, the Gospels... They're not here for us to draw out some kind of scheme or classifications. They're here for us to read and study in order that we would apply them, that we would live them out and practice them in our daily lives. There have been all kinds of classifications and subdivisions of the Sermon on the Mount as it's recorded in the Gospels. And there's been a lot of argument. Like how many Beatitudes are there? Seven? Eight? Nine? Let me just say this, brethren, out of the gate. If you want to spend your time on those kinds of technicalities, then you go right ahead. You go right ahead. But we've got to face the Beatitudes themselves. I can never forget. I can never forget a man who, whenever I met him, always impressed upon me the fact that he was a Bible student. He was the student. So I suppose in one way he was. 
But it seems to me that his life was very far removed from what was described in the pages of the New Testament. You see, Bible study was his hobby. And this is the thing which causes me fear. Because you can be a Bible student in that mechanical sense. As people spend their time analyzing literature, Shakespeare, in the same way people analyze scripture. An analysis of scripture is all right as long as it's in a subordinate position. And as long as we're careful, careful, it doesn't grip us in such a way that we become interested only in an objective, somehow intellectual sense. That's vanity. It's a unique word. And we cannot approach it like any other books. And I understand, I understand the saints in the church in times past who used to say that we should never read the Bible except on our knees. I understand. And we need this reminder. We need this reminder as we approach the Word of God. We need it. Because the word of God is truth. And the word of God speaks directly to us. And so the reason why I believe it's important for us to take the Sermon on the Mount as a whole before we come to details is the danger of missing the wood because of the trees. You see, we're all ready to fix certain statements and concentrate on them at the expense of others. We do that, don't we? So how do we correct that tendency? Well, I believe we do it by realizing that no part of the Sermon on the Mount could be understood truly, except in the light of the whole. The whole. You see, the Sermon on the Mount is like a great musical composition, a symphony, if you like. Now, the whole is greater than a collection of the parts. And that's why I say we cannot and must not lose sight of this wholeness. And I don't hesitate to say to you this morning then unless we've understood and grasped the Sermon on the Mount as a whole, we can't possibly understand any one of its particular parts. I mean that it's idle and useless to confront anybody with any injunction in the Sermon on the Mount unless a person's already believed, accepted, and conformed to it, and is living the Beatitudes of it. And that's where the so-called social application of the Sermon on the Mount is a fallacy. And I believe it's a heresy. People have applied it that way so often, especially in this generation we find ourselves in. For example, they'll maybe select this matter of turning the other cheek. And so they take that out of the sermon and isolate it and on the basis of that, they've denounced all forms of war as being unchristian. Now, I'm not talking about pacifism. That's not what I want to talk about. And that's not the subject. What I'm concerned to show is this, that you can't take that particular injunction and hold it up to an individual or a nation or to the world unless that particular individual or that particular nation where the whole world is already living and practicing and conforming to the Beatitudes. You see what I'm getting at, brethren? All the particular injunctions which we should consider follow the Beatitudes. 
which with the sermon starts. So that's what I mean when I say we've got to start by a kind of general view of the whole before we can even begin to consider the particular parts. So in other words, everything in the Sermon on the Mount, if we treat it rightly, if we're to benefit from considering it, we've got to take it in its setting. And as I've emphasized, the order in which the statements come in the sermon is of supreme importance. And brethren, listen, the Beatitudes, they don't come at the end. They come at the beginning. Unless we're perfectly clear about them, we should go no further. In fact, we have no right to go further. There's sort of a logical sequence in the sermon. And not only that, there's a spiritual order and sequence. Our Lord Jesus doesn't say these things accidentally, brethren. The whole thing is deliberate. Deliberate. It's wrong to ask anybody who's not first a Christian to try to live or practice the Sermon on the Mount. <clears throat> you ever thought about that? To expect Christian conduct from a person who is not born again, that is heresy. That is outright blind foolishness. Let me say that again. To expect Christian conduct from a person who's not born again, that's heresy. The appeals of the gospel in terms of conduct and ethics and morality, listen, are always based on the assumption that the people to whom the injunctions are addressed are, in fact, Christian. And that's obvious in any one of the epistles. And it's equally obvious here. Take any epistle you like and you'll find that the subdivision in each one of them is the same. Always doctrine first, then deductions from doctrine. Principles are laid down, descriptions are given of Christians to whom the letter is written. And so because of that, because they believe that, therefore they are exhorted to do certain things. And we always tend to forget that every now and then that the New Testament was written to Christians. Christians. And the appeals in terms of ethics in every epistle are always addressed to believers, to those who are new men, new women, new boys, new girls in Christ Jesus our Lord. And this Sermon on the Mount is the same. It's the same. Now keep that in mind, my brothers and sisters in Christ, when it comes to the Sermon on the Mount. As we approach the Sermon on the Mount, you'll find it's almost true to say that every man has his own classification and his own subdivision. And so in a sense, you could ask, well, why shouldn't he? But isn't it futile? to ask what is the correct subdivision? What is the correct classification and contents of the Sermon on the Mount? Because there are various ways in which it can be subdivided, sure. The one that commends itself to me is this. I will divide it into general and particular. The general part of the sermon occupies verses three to verse six, or verses 16, three to 16. In that part of the text, between 3 and 16, you have certain broad statements with regard to the Christian. And then the remainder of the sermon is concerned with certain aspects of his life and conduct. First, the general theme, and then an illustration of this theme in particular. And we can subdivide it a little further for the sake of convenience. In verses 3 through 10, you see you have the character of the Christian described in and of itself. That's more or less the Beatitudes, which are a description of the character of the Christian in general. Then verse 11 and verse 12, I'd say, show us the character of the Christian is proved by the reaction of the world to him. 
We're told, blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. In other words, the character of the Christian is described positively and negatively. First, we see the sort of man he is, right? And then we're told because he is that, certain things happen to him. And yet it's still a general description. So obviously in verses 13 through 16, there's an account of the relationship of the Christian to the world, to the world. There's a description of the function of believers in society and in the world. And these descriptions are emphasized and elaborated. And then they're summed up, as it were, in exhortation. Remember, let your light so shine before men the same men that revile you and the same men that persecute you, that they may see your good works and glorify your Father, which is in heaven. <coughs> Excuse me. And so then there's a general account of the Christian. And I would suggest to you that we come to what I call the particular examples and illustrations of how the Christian should live in a world like this, like the one we find ourselves in. In verses 17 through 48, 17 through 48, we have the Christian facing the law of God and its demands. Facing the law of God and its demands. And you must remember, a general description of his righteousness is given. We're told of his relationships towards such matters as murder, uh, adultery, uh, divorce, and how he should speak, and then his position, what it should be with regard to the whole question of retaliation and self-defense, and, and his attitude toward his neighbor or neighbors. The principle involved is that the Christian is concerned, should be, about the spirit rather than the letter. This doesn't mean he ignores the letter, but he's more concerned more concerned about the spirit. The whole error of the Pharisees and the scribes was that they were interested only in the mechanical. That's right, only in the mechanical. The Christian view of the law is one that is concerned about the spirit. We are interested in the details only as they are an expression of the spirit. And that's worked out in terms of a number of examples and illustrations throughout the sermon. The whole, the whole relates to the Christian living his life in the presence of God, in active submission to the Lord, and entire dependence upon him. Entire dependence upon him. Consider these words. Take heed. Take heed. Heed that you do not your alms before men and to be seen of them. Otherwise, you have no reward of your Father which is in heaven. And now that continues on from the beginning to the end. And at the end, we're told the same thing. Therefore, take no thought, saying, What shall we eat? Or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. There I say, brethren, in clear sight for us is a description of the Christian as a man who knows he is always in the presence of God. In the presence of God. So what he's interested in is not the impression he makes on other men. No! What he's interested in is his relationship to God. And so when he prays, that's when you and I pray, brethren, we should be praising the Lord, that we are in his presence, that we can come to him without fear or wrath or doubt, that we're not interested in what other people are thinking. 
we are in the presence of our Father. Also, when we do our alms, when we go about doing good, as defined by Scripture, it's God that we should have in mind. It's God that we should have in mind. Not that we have our names put on a building. Not that we're recognized. No, God forbid. Not that we would have a statue of us built or a picture blown up of us in a church vestibule. God forbid. We dare not draw attention to us, but we should be conduits of glory. Glory that points only to Christ. Amen? Amen. Furthermore, as you and I meet problems in our life, our needs for food and clothing, don't we react to all the external things and influences? Yes. But all those things are viewed in the light of our relationship that we have with our Father. Now this is important with us. Every day, as it relates to our Christian life. The Sermon on the Mount gives us a general account of Christian men, women, boys, and girls who live who live with a godly fear. A godly fear. Judge not that ye be not judged. Enter in at the straight gate. Beware of false prophets. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. And so, brethren, you and I are likened to a Christian man who builds a house which he knows is going to be tested. Again, there's that general overview. We know that we're going to be tested, and we should be concerned about that, and that should be expressed in how we live our lives. In other words, we should live our lives based on what God thinks and not what men think. And so, we not only have a general analysis of the Sermon on the Mount, but a complete portrayal and representation of the church and the individual Christian carrying the church's witness throughout the world on a daily basis. Certain things always really characterize the Christian. And these are certainly the three most important principles. The Christian is a man who of necessity must be concerned about keeping God's law. Now think about that. I mentioned in the introduction about the fatal tendency to put up law and grace as antithesis in the wrong sense. In other words, we're not under law, but we're still meant to keep it. The righteousness of the law is meant to be fulfilled in us, says the Apostle Paul in writing to the Romans. Jesus Christ, coming in the likeness of sinful flesh, condemned sin in the flesh. Well, why? That the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. That's Romans chapter 8, verses 3 and 4. So, listen. The Christian is a man who is always, and always should be, concerned about living and keeping the law of God. And so here we're reminded how that's to be done. Again, brethren, again, listen. One of the essential things about the Christian is that he is a man who lives realizing he is in the presence of God. The world does not live this way. No, the world can't live that way. And that's the big difference between the Christian and the non-Christian. The Christian is a man, woman, boy or girl, whose every action should be performed in the light of his intimate relationship to God our Father. Now, I am not, and you are not, as it were, a free agent. We are children of the Most High, so that everything we do, we do from the standpoint of being well-pleasing in his sight. And that's why, brethren, the Christian of necessity should view everything that happens to you and I individually in this world entirely different, entirely different from everybody else. The New Testament emphasizes that everywhere. 
The Christian's not worried about food and drink and housing and clothing. It's not that he says these things don't matter. I've never met a Christian that would say that, no. But that's not our main concern. Those aren't the things that we live for. Brethren, as Christians, we really do sit loosely to this world and its affairs. But why? Why is that the case? Because we belong to another kingdom and another way. We don't go out of the world. That was the Roman Catholic era called monasticism. But the Sermon on the Mount doesn't tell you to go out of life in order to live the Christian life. It does say that your attitude is entirely different from that of a non-Christian, of course. And why? Well, the reason is because of your relationship to God and because of your utter dependence upon Him. Brethren, we should never worry about our circumstances in this world. Why? Because of our relationship to God in Christ. Remember that. Brethren, remember that. What's also true and equally fundamental is that as Christians, um, we are always to walk in the fear of the Lord, not craven fear, because the Bible says perfect love casteth out that fear. But not only do we approach God in terms of the epistle to the Hebrews, as it says, with reverence and godly fear, but we live our lives like that. You see, Christians are the only people in the world, the only people in the whole world who lives always with and under a sense of judgment. <coughs> Excuse me. And we do so because our Lord tells us to. He tells us, he tells us his building is going to be judged. He tells us the test of life is going to come. He tells us not to say, Lord, Lord, nor reply upon activities in the church as being of necessity sufficient because judgment is coming. And judgment by one who sees the heart. We carry this around with us, and we know this. The Lord doesn't look at the sheep's clothing outside, but he looks at the inward parts, doesn't he? So now the Christian man, a woman, boy, and girl, we together, we remember that. We remember that. And the final charge that will be laid against us modern Christians is the charge of superficiality. This is so manifested, really, more than any other time in history. It's, it's inescapable. That's, it's just a fact. More so than any other Christians living before us. The New Testament people, brethren, listen, they lived in fear of God. They accepted the teaching of the Apostle Paul when he said, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Second Corinthians verse 10, or 5 verse 10. That's addressed to Christians, brethren. But in 2019, in, at least in America, in the West, you mentioned that to fellow Christians, or at least those that profess to be, well, I tell you what, they don't like that. They don't like that. But that's the teaching of the Word of God. And that's the teaching of the Sermon on the Mount. We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Knowing, therefore, the terror of the Lord. Those are the words. Judgment is coming and it's going to begin at the house of God where it should begin, because of the claim we make. It's all impressed upon us here in the final section of the Sermon on the Mount. If you'll just study it, we should always be living and walking distrustful of the flesh. Put no confidence in the flesh, brethren. Distrustful of ourselves. 
knowing we must appear before the Lord and be judged by him. It is a straight gate. It is a narrow way. This way that leads to life. And it's so important that we remember this. It's so important that we look at the sermon in the general, in the whole, before we begin to argue with one another about what it means when it tells us to turn the other cheek and so on, all those technicalities. People always jump to these particulars. And that's a shame. We've got to step back and look at it as a whole and understand our position in Christ and our call to walk in Him in opposition to the standards the world sets. Now there's some principles that should govern the interpretation of this sermon, the Sermon on the Mount. Brethren, what's of supreme importance is that we must always remember that the Sermon on the Mount is a description of character. It's not some code of ethics. It's not some code of morals. It is a description of character. It's not to be regarded as a, a law, a kind of uh, new Ten Commandments or set of rules and regulations which are to be carried out by us, but rather as a description of what we are meant to be. It's as if our Lord says, because you are what you are, this is how you will face the law, and this is how you will live it. It follows from this that each particular injunction is not to be considered and then applied mechanically as a Pharisee would or some rule of thumb. Now that would make it ridiculous. People come to the Sermon on the Mount and say something like this. Take that injunction. If any man will sue thee at the law and take away thy coat, let him have thy cloak also. If you did that, you would soon have nothing left in the wardrobe. I mean, I've heard pretty much verbatim that kind of statement in regards to the Sermon on the Mount interpreted by someone who had no business uh, preaching, that's for sure. But that's the kind of approach that should never be made. That's not the way to look at it, brethren. What is inculcated is that I should be in such a spirit that under certain circumstances and conditions, I must do just that, throw in the cloak. Or go the second mile. Now think about that. All I am and all I have are his and are no longer mine. That's, that's the principle that should be in view. And I do find this relationship of the general to the particular something which is very difficult to put in words sometimes. I suppose one of the most difficult things uh, as far as thinking through this is to define what this relationship is. The nearest I can get to my own satisfaction is to put it like this. The relation of any particular injunction to the whole life of the soul is the relationship, I think, of the artist to the particular rules and laws that govern what he's doing. Take, for example, the realm of music. A man can play a piece of great music very accurately and maybe make no mistakes at all and yet it may be true to say of him that he did not really play Beethoven's Moonlight Sonata right he played the notes correctly but it was not the sonata what was he doing he was mechanically striking the right notes but missing the soul and the real interpretation he wasn't doing what Beethoven intended and meant so that, I think, is the relationship between the whole and the parts. The artist, the true artist, is always correct. Even the greatest artist cannot afford to neglect rules and regulations. But that's not what makes him the great artist. It's this something extra, the expression. It's the spirit. It's the life. It's the whole that he's able to convey. So there, it seems to me at least, is the relationship of the particular to the general in the Sermon on the Mount. You cannot divorce, you cannot separate them. No, no. The Christian, while 
he puts his emphasis upon the spirit, is also concerned about the letter. He's not concerned only about the letter, and he must never consider the letter apart from the spirit. Now you remember that. So let's try to summarize it this way. Here are some negative tests to apply. Brethren, if you find yourself arguing with the Sermon on the Mount at any point, it means either that there's something wrong with you or else that your interpretation of the sermon is wrong. Let me say that again. If you find yourself arguing with the Sermon on the Mount at any point, it means either that there's something wrong with you or else that your interpretation of the sermon is wrong. As I read the sermon, something hits me, and I want to argue with it. Well, I repeat. <coughs> it means either that my whole spirit is wrong. <coughs> Excuse me. My whole spirit is wrong, and I'm not living and exemplifying Beatitudes or else I'm interpreting that particular injunction in a wrong and false way. It's a very terrible sermon, this Sermon on the Mount. Be careful as you read it, and especially when you talk about it. If you criticize this sermon at any point, you're really saying a great deal about yourself. In the words of James, uh, be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. Again, if our interpretation makes any injunction appear to be ridiculous, then we can be certain that our interpretation is wrong. You see the argument I've already mentioned in earlier, <clears throat> excuse me, in my earlier notes about the illustration of the coat and the cloak. Such an interpretation must be wrong for nothing that our Lord ever taught can be ridiculous. Nothing. Finally, if you regard any particular injunction in the sermon as impossible, I've heard that said, impossible, once more, brethren, your interpretation and understanding must be wrong. Let me put it like this. Our Lord Jesus taught these things, and our Lord Jesus expects us to live them. His last injunction, you remember, to these men whom he sent out to preach was this. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. Now listen, in the Sermon on the Mount, we find those very things. He meant them to be taught. He meant them to be practiced. Our Lord Jesus himself lived the Sermon on the Mount. The apostles lived the Sermon on the Mount. And if you take the trouble to read the lives of the saints down through the centuries, and the women, men, boys, girls, who've been most greatly used of God, you'll find that every time, every time they have been people who have taken the Sermon on the Mount, not just seriously, but literally. You read the life of a man like Hudson Taylor, and you'll find he lived it. He's not the only one. There are so many more. These things were taught by the Lord and were meant for us, his people, to live them. This is how the Christian is meant to live. There was a time, there was a time, when the designation applied to the Christian was that he was a God-fearing man. God-fearing man. I don't think you can improve upon that. I don't think you can improve upon that, brethren. To be a God-fearing man, woman, boy, and girl should be your goal in life. It does not mean, again, craven fear. It doesn't mean the fear that has torment. But brethren, listen very carefully. It is a wonderful description of a true Christian. He or she is of necessity 
as we are reminded very forcibly in the seventh chapter of this gospel, a man who lives in the fear of God. We can say of our blessed Lord Jesus himself that his life was a God-fearing life. You see how important that view of the Christian is? So often, as I've been trying to point out, modern Christians who may be able to give a very bright and apparently thrilling testimonies of some experience they've had don't suggest that they are God-fearing people, but give the impression of being men of the world both in dress and appearance and in a kind of boisterous and easy confidence. So, we must not only take the injunctions of the Sermon on the Mount seriously, but we've got to check our particular interpretation in light of the principles I've given. Beware of the spirit of arguing against them. Beware of making them ridiculous. Beware of interpreting them as to regard any one of them as impossible, as some have said. Here is the life to which we are called. Again, I say again to you, if only every Christian in the church today were living the Sermon on the Mount, the great revival for which we are praying and longing for would have already come. Amazing things would happen. The world would be shocked. Yes, even the unbelieving world would be shocked. And others would be drawn and attracted to our Lord. I pray God would give us grace to consider the Sermon on the Mount and to remember that we are not to sit in judgment on it, but that we ourselves are under judgment. And that the building we are erecting in this world and in this life will have to face his, the Lord Jesus' final test and scrutiny. The scrutiny under the eye of the Lamb of God. Brethren, consider that. Consider that soberly. Consider that in the fear and admonition of the Lord. As we in our next study, enter into an introduction of the Beatitudes. Let us pray. Father, we know that there is a time of judgment coming. We know that not only for the world, but also for the body of Christ. And while we know we have an everlasting rest prepared by you, we know that our Lord Jesus stands as our high priest. We also know that there is a call in our lives to be faithful to you. And part of that faithful call and expectation is that we live in such a way that glorifies you. We have that laid out before us. Lord Jesus, in your sermon on the mount. Thank you, Lord, that you stand as such an high priest for us, a high priest who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners and made higher than the heavens, who needeth not daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifice first for his own sins and then for his people's, because you did this once when you offered up yourself. We praise you, Lord, you who are consecrated forevermore. Help us, Lord, here on earth to see the shadow of heavenly things and be admonished to look to the pattern you've left for us to live out our testimony here, an overcoming testimony, and the ministry that you've given to us. Help us to be faithful in preaching and teaching the whole counsel of God. As we look to the Sermon on the Mount, Lord, as we enter into the study of the Beatitudes, Lord, open up our ears and our hearts unto you, that we would be faithful and bring honor and glory to your name with the time we have left. Let it be so, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. God.
be with you till we meet again. God be with you till we meet again.